many thanks uh, for the opportunity to be able to present today some of our work on machine learning in cancer imaging, which I'm going to focus on today. So today, what I'd like to talk about over the next 15 minutes or so is, first of all, to take a wider look at how do we identify the areas to focus on? Because obviously, um, undertaking a machine learning or AI project is very convoluted. There's a lot of work, a lot of data collection. So we want to be certain that we're focusing our efforts on important areas. So I wanted to just briefly touch on how we identify important areas to focus on. I'd like to give uh, three example studies, uh, whole body MRI in cancer detection. I'd like to just talk briefly about radiomics and also opportunistic screening for frailty in cancer patients. And then I'd just like to wrap up with how we do all of this, bearing in mind that patient confidentiality and safety should be at the center of our work. So first of all, how do we identify areas to focus on? What makes a good so-called use case? We always have to start with the important unmet clinical need. In other words, we need to identify a problem that we would like to overcome that's considered highly important and relevant to patient care and that we're struggling with. And that, that really is the first stepping stone. We need to identify these areas. But we can't solve all the problems. We need to be sure that we have a problem that we can potentially be helped by AI. We need to have sufficient data to be able to train and test an algorithm. So if we have an important, difficult problem, but we don't have sufficient data, it's uh, probably not the right, right uh, step for us to be taking at this moment in time. So I've just given you a sort of overview here of how we uh, undertake safe imaging AI from the use case all the way to the clinical application. And the first thing is that we need to identify the clinically relevant use case. We need to identify which data we're going to use for that. And then we go through the process of de-identification, annotating the data with important information, training and optimizing the tool, and then testing. And then we get to the important clinical translation where we have have a lot of work to do on deployment and auditing the outcomes. So that's the sort of overview. And at first, I'm just going to talk about clinically relevant use cases. So I've taken three examples, all of which are part of work ongoing at Imperial. The first one is detection of breast cancer at screening mammography. And uh, this is an important use case because screening mammography is undertaken on a population basis, but we do have uh, false positives and false negatives readings. What that means is that false positives means sometimes the radiologist picks up a tumor, what they think is a tumor, and it turns out to be something benign, and a false negative uh, where we miss uh, a tumor. And the screening uh, mammography uh, is, a, is a big job because two radiologists read each scan. And so this is a heavy workforce burden. And as we all know, we have a workforce uh, radiology crisis in the UK. So we have two problems. And um, in this really fantastic study that was published uh, by members of our team here, Ara Darzi and others, um, they looked at an AI system for breast cancer screening we're fortunate that we have very large data sets in the UK. We also used a smaller data set in the US for testing and evaluation. And the AI system was trained to read the mammograms to identify tumors. It was uh, trained on a UK training set, tested on a US data set, but also tested against radiology reads. And in this one of the first really big studies in, in mammography, they found that there was a reduction in 5.7% and 1.7% in false positives in the USA and UK data sets, a reduction in 9.4 and 2.7% respectively in the false negatives for the USA and UK data sets. And they found that using the AI tool together with the second reader, Reduce the workload by 88%. So this was a really exciting first step. And now there's huge work uh, ongoing at the moment to try and bring AI into mammography screening in the UK. A second very important area is detection of lung cancer on CT, potentially as part of a lung cancer screening program, uh, which will be coming into 
workforce. Um, and identification of suspicious nodules by radiologists is, is actually quite a tough thing until they get relatively large. Sometimes the nodules, we can see some examples here, can look just like some blood vessels in cross-section. And so we have work going on uh, with Mit Mitchell Chen and uh, Eric Abouage's group looking at identification of nodules um, together with the clinical radiologist Sue Copley. Another area where we have relatively large volume imaging um, and relatively complex imaging is the detection of prostate cancer on prostate MRI. And we have some work going on in our own department with a convergent science PhD student looking at identifying the high risk areas within the prostate gland. And this is just an example taken where we have a tumor here at the front of the prostate gland and a machine learning algorithm has been trained to detect detect uh, the lesion. This is in an earlier stage in lab testing. It isn't really rolled out yet, but this is, this is an area which we would like to take forward because um, this is a relatively difficult uh, examination to read by radiologists, but we have a very large volume of these scans to read. And so by having an AI algorithm, we could potentially improve our performance and time of read. So this is how we identify good use cases. So I'd like to go through a couple of study examples that are ongoing at the moment uh, in which I'm taking part. So I, I have a little bit more in-depth knowledge. So the first one is whole body MRI in cancer detection. Uh, there were th several areas where whole body MRI has been shown to be useful. Um, and we've used these use cases to see whether we can help train a machine learning algorithm to pick up the sites of cancer on the whole body MRI to help the radiologist, as these studies are quite large studies, they're relatively difficult to read, um, but they have been found to be useful. So we would like to help support radiologists to use this. So how did we get started? First of all, we looked at healthy volunteer whole body MRI, um, and we actually trained the algorithm to understand the whole body MRI using a machine learning pipeline, uh, putting together the scans and identifying all the organs. We manually had to segment and annotate the organs to develop this whole body MRI uh, organ segmentation tool, which was our first step. And we can see that um, we could uh, identify the organs relatively well using a machine learning algorithm. And we could also measure uh, how well the algorithm performed formed using this particular metric, which is a dice uh, correlation coefficient. And we can just identify areas where we did well and areas where we did worse. And then the next step on was to train the algorithm to identify sites of cancer. We used a large data set using lung cancer and colon cancer from a previous streamlined study. And then we added the algorithm, which comes up as a heat map on top of the whole body MRI. And we can see here a tumor uh, in the colon, which has been given a bright red. This is a high probability of cancer on a whole body MRI that's been added into a normal radiology reading platform. And this was our first big whole body MRI study. We found no statistical difference in detection rates, but some reduction in the time taken to read the scan. We use this information to take this forward into multiple myeloma whole body MRI, which is a real unmet clinical need. This is a CT scan from a patient with myeloma. Here we can see the MRI where we can, here we can almost not see the disease, but here we can see disease uh, is very extensive. Um, and it, it is known now and NICE have confirmed that whole body MRI is the best way to uh, evaluate myeloma. Um, and uh, I worked together with Christina Messu at the um, ICR to develop a study looking at uh, machine learning techniques to identify myeloma. We can see the challenge. These are for uh, healthy patients uh, on whole body MRI, and these are patients with myeloma. And we can see that in some instances, it's very difficult to tell the difference between a normal bone marrow and a myelomatous bone marrow. So we really wanted to work hard to try and train an algorithm to help us detect this. It's difficult to interpret. 
And we're in the midst of this study now. We've done a lot of machine learning with the team at um, South Kensington, uh, together with Ben Glocker. And we have developed machine learning algorithms to pick up diffuse patterns, as well as focal patterns of myeloma. And these results will be forthcoming in the next months. Another area that we've been looking at is radiomics to understand cancer outcomes. And here we look at the grayscale patterns beyond the human eye to understand the imaging a little bit better. So here we have a, a study of radiomics in ovarian cancer. We have ovarian lesions. Uh, we have a big data set that we've segmented. We then develop a machine learning algorithm to identify areas and features on the radiomics which tell us about the cancer. And we link those to surgical outcomes, chemotherapy resistance and survival data. And we can use this to predict high risk cases. So we can have a radiomics group that are very high risk of early uh, death, whereas those that will survive better. And this can allow us to select patients for the right treatment for the level of risk that the patient demonstrates. We've also been able to link the radiomics to the underlying genetics. So we have positive correlations of certain genetic pathways and negative correlations with others. So we start to understand how the radiomics uh, links with, with the tumor biology and genetics. And then the final example is opportunistic screening for frailty in cancer patients. Why would we want to do this? We know that uh, frailty and loss of muscle uh, predicts survival in many types of cancer, as well as other diseases. And this is a study, again, that I did collaboratively with the Royal Marsden Hospital. And we can see that muscle attenuation is a good predictor of a poor survival versus a longer survival. A lot of groups started asking me about uh, providing muscle measurements. Uh, uh, and so we decided to automate this process. And we've now developed an automated uh, software where a CT scan can be automatically uh, measured for muscle. Um, and we've tested this on many data sets now to identify how good the automatic performs against the manual segmentation. We have a very, very good correlation. Although I have given you one example here of a difficult case where the patient has uh, fluid in the subcutaneous tissues and the algorithm has gone wrong. So we always have to remember that these algorithms are never perfect. So we need to keep an eye. And then just to wrap up, how do we do this with patient confidentiality and safety at the center of our work? If we go back to this pipeline, we have this so-called trusted research environment where we have de-identified uh, data where we can work on all of this optimization and testing, um, as well as the safety of the clinical translation. We need to work on that as well um, in order to ensure patient safety and clinical audit once these um, tools are released into the clinical um, uh, environment, we will need to ensure patient safety and performance. And this is the so-called trusted research environment five safes. We have to work in a safe setting where we prevent unauthorized use and we securely store and control access to safe data, which is treated uh, in order to protect con confidentiality. We need safe people, researchers trained and authorized to use the work, doing safe projects, which is research for the public good that yields safe outputs that are screened and approved outputs um, that are non-disclosive. And I like to add a last one, which is safe for the environment. We need to optimize and minimize the carbon impact of our data storage. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in that area as we speak. So to wrap up, in conclusion, AI applications are being developed at pace with collaborative work between clinical radiologists and AI scientists. We need to ensure that these are safe with a focus on patient benefit. And the key features that I've discussed today are that we need to identify a clear and important unmet clinical need to identify an important use case, we need to develop a data set that allows AI training to be effective and testing that the AI tool works effectively, not only in the lab, but what we so call in the wild once it's released into clinical practice. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop sharing my screen now.